June 25th, 2006. The Frankenstadion in Nuremberg, Germany. Portugal versus the Netherlands. Two of world football's big hitters in red hot heat, facing off in probably the most eagerly anticipated round of 16 tie of the 2006 World Cup. Portugal boasted a forward line containing Luis Figo, Cristiano Ronaldo and Deco. Meanwhile, the Netherlands could call upon the varied talents of Wesley Schneider, Robin van Persie and Ian Robben. It was a game, however, that wouldn't be remembered for the flair or attacking prowess of those on either side, but rather for the viciousness and sheer chaos that engulfed the game. There was literal blood, sweat, and tears, in addition to a record-breaking 20 bookings, including four red cards. The game became known as the Battle of Nuremberg, or the Massacre of Nuremberg in Dutch, as the Netherlands lost 1-0. And it is a game that still lives long in the memory for many football fans almost 18 years on. It was just one of many iconic games and moments of the 2006 World Cup, though, from Rooney's red card, also against Portugal, and Graham Pohl's three yellow cards, to Zinedine Zidane's Penenka, headbutt, and red card all of his own in the final. When you look back at the players that a whole host of teams had at that World Cup, perhaps it ought to be no wonder that it produced so many memorable moments. Aside from Portugal and the Netherlands, the hosts, Germany, had Bastian Schweinsteiger, Michael Ballack, and World Cup maestro Miroslav Kloser in their ranks. England were at the height of their so-called gold generation, boasting the likes of Beckham, Lampard, Gerrard, Rooney, Owen, Ferdinand, Terry, and Cole. Argentina had Raquel May, Crespo, Tevez, and a very young Lionel Messi. France were blessed with Zidane, Makalele, Vieira, Henri, Ribéry, Toram, and Trezeguet. Spain had Casillas, Puyol, Ramos, Xavi, Iniesta, Alonso, Fabregas, Raul, Torres, and Villa. The holders, Brazil, could call upon the likes of Ronaldinho, Ronaldo, Kaká, Cafu, Robinho, Roberto Carlos, and Adriano. And, of course, the eventual winners, Italy, named the likes of Buffon, Cannavaro, Nesta, Zambrotta, De Rossi, Gattuso, Pirlo, Del Piero, Tony Totti, and Inzaghi, among a litany of star players. Even the likes of Sweden had Lundberg, Ibrahimovic and Larsson, the Czech Republic had Nedved, Rosicki and Czech, and Australia had Cahill, Kuhl and Baduka. I recently saw it claimed online that the 2006 World Cup was the moment in which football peaked, and that it has all been downhill since then. We no longer have so many super teams or star-studded squads. Gone is the inspirational individual brilliance of flair players like Ronaldinho or Raquel May. And gone too are the days of endless chaos and excitement that made football the most popular entertainment and participation sport on the planet. Replaced by athletes rather than entertainers, the supremacy of systems over individual flair or invention, and an obsession with control and ever-diminishing the amount of chaos in the game. Or at least, that's the claim. And it is one that you'll find everywhere on group chats, in the stands on a weekend, and on social media. But is it actually true? Have footballers really got worse, or at least less technically gifted, and has football become less enjoyable and entertaining, or are we all just getting older, looking back with rose-tinted spectacles, and, in the words of Harold Macmillan, we have never had it so good. Well, having long pondered all of the above, that's what today's video is all about. So sit back, relax, and join me on a journey back in time. Back to the good old days, before all of this ticky tacker, gag and press, VAR and XG nonsense, as we take a look at whether football has actually got worse in recent years, or whether it's all just blind nostalgia. At the core of the debate about whether football has got worse, or at least less enjoyable, is a sense that something has been lost. That something, above all else I think, is a sense of spontaneity, eccentricity and fun. Throughout the history of football, the most beloved players haven't always necessarily been the best players, but the most entertaining and inventive. It's why the likes of Len Shackleton and Rach Carter captured the imagination even more than Tommy Lawton or Stanley Matthews in the 40s and 50s, why Garincha, not Pele, was nicknamed the Joy of the People, and more recently, why the likes of Best, Maradona, Cantona, Gascoigne, Zola and Romario always captured the public's imagination. 
The fact that Stanley Matthews and Pele, for example, who were objectively the greatest players of their generations, were so perfect, squeaky clean media personas, incredibly dedicated professionals, and almost flawless in terms of their decision making, almost made them seem more alien. Make no mistake, both were still adored, and both were still incredibly gifted and creative. But in a way, that was difficult for fans to identify with. But someone like Garincha, who was so flawed in terms of his personal life and so unpredictable on the pitch, well, that only made him more relatable. It wasn't just that Eric Cantona was brilliant at football, but the fact that he kung fu kicked a Crystal Palace fan and then gave a bizarre speech about seagulls and trawlers that no one quite understood. When the seagulls follow the trawler, it's because they sink sardines will be strong into the sea. Thank you. <laughs> Stuff like that only added to the appeal. These were human beings who would lose the ball, make mistakes every now and then, and have moments of sheer madness both on and off the pitch, but also provide moments of pure inspiration that made you fall in love with the sport all over again. And to that extent, the mistakes and the madness didn't detract from the affection for these players, it strengthened it, making them more human and more relatable. It is why, for a long time, and even to this day in fact, despite the 2022 World Cup, Diego Maradona is still much more adored in Argentina than Lionel Messi. By almost any metric now, especially following the last World Cup, Messi has had a far superior career to Maradona. One can argue about sheer ability or their respective peaks, though even there, I think that there is a solid case to be made that Messi still comes out on top, but in terms of goals, assists, consistency, longevity, trophies, records, and virtually whatever else you can think of, there is no comparison. Both on the pitch and off it though, Maradona was pure chaos. From the mid-1980s onwards, Maradona was a cocaine addict, which saw him banned for 15 months in the early 1990s. He was sent off against Argentina's great rivals Brazil in a 3-1 defeat at the 1982 World Cup, and he was sent home from the 1994 World Cup in disgrace and handed another lengthy ban, this time after testing positive for the use of a banned performance-enhancing substance. You might have thought that would have damaged Maradona's reputation, but his fallibilities only made him more relatable and added to the reverence that surrounded him. Messi, by contrast, was viewed as being so polished and perfect, refined and developed within the four walls of La Masia in Europe, rather than on the harsh streets of Buenos Aires, that it was somehow harder for mere mortals to identify with him. Messi's failures with the national team, therefore, engendered far less sympathy, and it is ironic in some ways that it was as much Messi's change of personality, the slight roughness and nastiness that he showed at the 2022 World Cup, particularly against the Netherlands, that changed the perception of him in Argentina, as it was his starring role in actually winning Argentina the World Cup, as Maradona had done in 1986, with even more controversial moments. Footballers across the board, not just using isolated examples, have become much less relatable in recent years, largely through no fault of their own. No longer are players, or even clubs themselves in many cases, rooted within their local communities. Clubs have either become companies, or even subsidiaries in many instances now, forming part of soulless multi-club ownership models owned by hedge funds, or the playthings or propaganda tools of billionaires and despotic nation-states. Players, meanwhile, at the highest level at least, now earn more money than God. Whereas once, footballers were not just embedded within their local communities, but often actually heralded from them, now they live entirely separate lives and have very little in common with most football supporters, weakening those social bonds and the sense of affinity or connection with fans. That is partly, of course, because of those ever-expanding and now almost unimaginable wealth disparities, but also because of social media and, even more importantly in fact, traditional media, which means that players now would pay a far heavier price than those in previous generations for showing personality and being relatable, hence why I say that it's largely through no fault of their own. On the pitch, likewise, which I think is even more relevant here, for the most part, it's not footballers themselves who have decided to become more risk-averse. 
fundamentally, systems, not individuals, have taken precedence as the 21st century has progressed. Pep Guardiola, the greatest manager of his generation, if not of all time, who will almost certainly go down as the most decorated manager that this sport has ever seen, is perhaps the sharpest edge of this trend. It's well documented that Guardiola has an aversion to big egos, and no amount of talent will compensate for failing to carry out his very specific set of instructions. Thierry Henry often recalls the story of how he drifted inside off the left flank for Barca in a game against Sporting in the Champions League, as he so often used to do at Arsenal, using his intuition in order to link up with Lionel Messi and scoring the goal which put Barcelona 1-0 up. Pep's response was to substitute Henry at half-time, replacing him with an 18-year-old Bojan. This wasn't a young Pedro or Jeffren we're talking about, it was Thierry Henry, a World Cup winner who had been one of the best players in the world for the preceding decade. Henry tells the story to credit Guardiola and to celebrate the clarity of his game plan and the discipline with which he wanted it to be executed. And whereas other players like Zlatan Ibrahimovic may have considered themselves too good or simply have grown frustrated at being reduced to playing the role effectively of pieces on a chessboard, Henri went on to embrace it and has talked about incorporating it into his own managerial style. Of course, the reason why Henri embraced it and why most players embrace whatever Guardiola asks of them is because they can see the results. This is a gross oversimplification, and Guardiola's tactics have developed and evolved a great deal from his first season at Barcelona to now, but in its purest form, what Guardiola seeks is control and minimising risk. Because his teams tend to be so good, their greatest enemy is chaos, in which anything can happen. That's why the teams that have typically undone Guardiola, at least on the big occasions, have been Liverpool, particularly at Anfield, where they've been able to disrupt Pep's game plan and Manchester City's rhythm, breeding confusion, and Real Madrid under Carlo Ancelotti, with the notable exception of last season, of course, who is one of few elite-level managers within the modern game, who doesn't adopt such a strict system-based approach and still allows his players a great deal of freedom. In the 2021-22 Champions League semi-final between Manchester City and Real Madrid, which Man City led 5-3 on aggregate at the beginning of the 90th minute of the second leg, but somehow still went on to lose the game 6-5, for over 180 minutes, everything went to plan for Guardiola. Manchester City controlled both legs, they were the better team, and they denied Real Madrid of many glaring opportunities. In fact, in the first 90 minutes of the second leg, Real Madrid didn't register a single shot. But in those five or six crazy minutes, the old school football of Madrid, relying upon the individual ability of the likes of Rodrigo and Karim Benzema, and the intuitive relationship between players, managed to undo Pep's meticulous game plan. Nine times out of ten, however, that isn't the case which is why a more top-down approach to football has gained hegemony over the last 10 to 15 years. There are a few better examples of the pepification of football than Jack Grealish. At Aston Villa, Grealish was the talisman. Due to his unique talents and the fact that he was capable of winning a game for Villa on his own, he was afforded a great deal of freedom. I've shown this before, but if you look at Grealish's heat map in the 2019-20 season, this is very clearly illustrated. Though he was ostensibly playing on the left wing, you can see quite often how deep he would drop to receive the ball, the central areas he would routinely drift into, and even a fair amount of red on the opposite flank. Now, just compare and contrast that with Grealish's heat map so far this season, where he has basically hugged the touchline, getting up and down that left flank and looking to make advancements into the box, something which he is superb at. No one in their right mind would suggest that Man City or Pep are currently getting the best out of Guardiola, or that he has been anywhere near as fun to watch at the Etihad as he was at Villa Park. In fact, even from a purely numbers perspective, Grealish's goals and assists are down, as is his XG. But then, Guardiola has made Grealish into a treble winner, something that he could never have done playing with freedom and expressing himself at Aston Villa, or pretty much anywhere else for that matter. Pep Guardiola doesn't care, fundamentally, about whether he has the best or the most exciting version of Jack Grealish. He cares about whether he is getting the best and most effective version of Man City, which wins the most points and trophies because, in fairness, whether you love it or loathe it, 
That is his job. It's his job, isn't it? In a sense, that is the paradoxical state within which modern football operates. Football is an entertainment business, first and foremost. Its existence, and certainly its flourishing, is dependent on people watching it, either live or on television, and finding that to be an enjoyable enough experience to want to do it time and time again. In that sense, it's no different to a television show or a movie franchise where maximising viewer attention and satisfaction is the modus operandi. However, almost everyone who is directly involved in the sport, managers, owners, players, consider it to be almost solely a results business, and their principal role being to win first, and to entertain second, if at all. Of course, teams have won and been successful whilst being entertaining, and there isn't an objective best, most fun, or most exciting way in which to play football. Nonetheless, there is a clear collision course between these two aims and ideals of entertainment versus results. And as the money in football continues to ramp up, and the people who run the sport, increasingly, care most about results and the bottom line, that divide is only likely to expand. And yet, that money, and that bottom line, is entirely dependent on people still considering football to be good entertainment and a good use of their time and resources. You can see how it becomes a bit of a paradox. Right now though, the evidence is clear. No significant damage has been done to interest in the sport by football becoming more results driven, systems triumphing over individuals, and a reduction in flair and expression. In fact, Football has never been more popular or lucrative than it is now, and it is still somehow continuing to grow, despite already being by far the most popular sport on the planet. Whether there will be negative consequences in the long term, not just because of the changing styles, but also the reduced competitiveness, and the fact that throughout Europe's top leagues, we see the same teams winning domestic trophies, and reaching the latter stages of the Champions League season upon season, still remains to be seen. My personal view is that, to a certain extent, football is in serious danger of losing one of its least recognised, but most important USPs. Without wanting to upset anyone here, or insult other sports, most, if not almost all sports, are highly repetitive. Whether it be cricket, basketball, golf, rugby, darts or athletics, what you are typically seeing is the same actions repeated time and time again, almost like muscle memory, and the person or team who repeats them with the most proficiency tends to win. There are a few exceptions, all sports have occasional mavericks and innovators, but broadly speaking that is the case. Football, by contrast, has never been like that. The extreme contrast in styles between teams, players and coaches, along with the very nature of the sport itself, meant that, quite often, something would happen in a game of football which had either never happened or at least you had never seen happen before. The Dennis Burkamps, Georgi Hadjis and JJ Kotchers of this world tried things and pulled off things which created such random and unpredictable passages of play. It wasn't just those great players either, football as a whole was much more instinctive and off the cuff. Players were taught how to play, through coaching, but not what to do, when, where and how, and certainly not to anywhere near the same extent. What we see now, therefore, is very repeated patterns of play formulated by intensely coached players with a very specific set of instructions. We still get moments of randomness, unpredictability, genius and chaos. It is in the nature of the sport, but they are becoming fewer and farther between, making football much more similar to those more repetitive and monotonous sports that it once had the edge over. None of this is lost on footballers themselves, at least outside of the youngest of them, to whom it is all that they have ever known. Responding to a clip of a goal that he scored against Burnley in 2010 on Twitter, Cesc Fabregas wrote to Samir Nasri, quote, Pass and move, pass and move my friend. Nowadays, they wouldn't allow you to do this. End quote. When someone responded asking, By they, I assume you mean the opposing team, Fabregas responded, Modern football, modern coaches. 
It's important to note that, while he is emblematic of this shift, and a seminal figure purely by virtue of his extraordinary success, Pep Guardiola is no longer the exception but the rule. Whereas Guardiola has coached the chaos and creativity out of the likes of Grealish, Gabriel Jesus, and some would say already, he is starting to with Jeremy Doku, increasingly, youth team players have already had these qualities diminished by the time that they reach the first team. Just take someone like Bakayo Saka, who is one of the finest young players not just in English, but in all of world football right now. Saka is brilliant to watch, in the sense that he is immensely talented, and makes lots of goal-scoring or chance-creating actions. However, for someone so talented, who broke through so young, it is hard to imagine in any previous generation that Saka wouldn't have had more flair, maybe more rawness, and more of a tendency to attempt outlandish things. None of this is an insult to Saka, whose decision-making and efficiency are outstanding, and he would only have had those attributes coached out of him regardless. But he is symptomatic of a revolution in hyper-specialising and, some would argue, over-coaching, which has swept the academy game, at least throughout most of Europe. We still tend to see South Americans come to Europe in their teens and early 20s, with much more of that flair and sense of freedom and adventure, but it is soon zapped out of them the naive fools, thinking they can come over here and enjoy themselves. In this sense, Neymar is an almost unique case of an uber-elite player in his generation who has refused to be tamed or toned down the more elaborate aspects of his game on almost any occasion. And in response, he has also become perhaps the most heavily criticised player of his generation. There are, of course, other reasons that Neymar receives criticism, but this is undoubtedly a big part of it. Whereas Messi and Ronaldo, who are, were, or at least ought to have been Neymar's natural peers, radically changed their game over the years, Messi under Pep Guardiola incidentally, who transformed him from being a technical marvel in the mould of a Ronaldinho into one of the most prolific goalscorers of all time, and Ronaldo under Alex Ferguson, who oversaw his transition from being a tricky wide man obsessed with attempting ever more elaborate and carefully rehearsed tricks, flicks, and pieces of skill into a ruthless goal-scoring and counter-attacking machine, Neymar has never really changed the fundamental way in which he thinks about football or plays the game. He has been rewarded for that stubbornness by most people looking at the number of goals that he has scored, still more than 350 at club level, it should be said, which is more than Wayne Rooney, Didier Drogba, and he will soon overtake Thierry Henry, as well as being Brazil's all-time leading goal scorer. But they compare it to Messi and Ronaldo's output, more than 800 goals each, and they conclude that Neymar was never on the same level as those two. And maybe he wasn't, that is a matter of opinion, rather than the topic of debate in this video. But if he wasn't, then it wasn't solely because he scored fewer goals, or enjoyed expressing himself too much on the pitch. Johan Cruyff was much more prolific in his teenage years than he was when he won three successive European Cups and Ballon d'Ors, but that didn't mean that he got worse at football, quite the opposite. Some of you may recall the Nike, or Nike to American viewers, Risk Everything ad campaign from 10 years ago. I will play a very short clip of it for you just in case you don't. Flawed. 76% probability of missing the target. Reckless. 50% chance of failure. And this is not an acceptable way to arrive at training. Even the greatest players of our time make mistakes. They take too many risks. After all, they're only human. But what if they weren't? I give you the future of football. Our clones. Flawless decision-making. Guaranteed results. It's what the people want. In 2014, that seemed like a fun little advert. Now it feels like more of a prophecy of what was to come, and is still playing out, except the adverts ended with the real players, well, the Nike-endorsed ones of course, overcoming the clones, a development we're yet to witness in the real world. All of this, it should be said, is quite different to the claim that footballers have actually got worse, which has gained increased prominence over the last few years. In a recent interview with the consulted Bullbag and the Katie Hopkins of football punditry, Mr. Simon Jordan, Michael Owen made this claim. Now, if you can just run a bit further than everyone else and you can basically pass it from A to B, you're getting a decent career in the Premier League. You don't really? even have to be that good anymore. 
I don't think that it's true to say that you don't even have to be that good to have a career in the Premier League anymore. The competition to make it in football at academy and senior level has never been more intense, but it is true that the requirements, and therefore the players who make it have changed, and fitness and athleticism have probably never been more important. Part of that is to do with the systems that we've already talked about and the rigorous demands in terms of pressing and intensity, but part of it is another problem with modern football, which no one at the top of the game has any incentive to address and are actually making actively worse, which is the number of games. If elite level footballers are being asked to play more than 60, sometimes more than 70 games a season, at that intensity, one, we shouldn't be surprised when their bodies break down and we lose them for extended periods of time, thus reducing the quality of games by their absence, nor should we be surprised to see a lowering of standards due to general burnout and exhaustion, and two, we can hardly act shocked or dismayed about athleticism and physical attributes, rather than technical ones, becoming so pivotal to carving out a career at the highest level. One of the brightest minds in modern football, Steve Bruce, often used to say that footballers could play seven days a week. No problem, but don't expect them to produce anything like their best form or what they would be capable of if they were fully fit, well rested, and properly prepared for games. Too much football is a problem which isn't just impacting players, and by extension the quality of football they are able to produce, the requirements of them, and the entertainment value provided to fans, it's also having a direct impact on the way in which fans engage with the sport. In other words, it's not just that there's too much football, it's that there's too much football on television, and it has removed a lot of the mysticism that once surrounded the sport. Whereas fans used to watch great players in maybe a handful of games each season, and they would only be in the biggest games, which are inevitably likely to be more tense and exciting, the rest of the time they were seeing them through highlights. This certainly does lead to an element of nostalgia when it comes to players from previous generations, who are appreciated through the form of highlights which, by their very nature, tend to show exclusively a player's best moments. If Zinedine Zidane played now, you'd probably have people watching him play 20 or 30 times a season instead of only 4 or 5, pointing out that he was quiet or did nothing in X amount of them, sharing his 5 consecutive sub 7 out of 10 scores on sofa score, and taking to social media to call him a bald frog-eating fraud. Instead, at the time, most people watched the Serie A or Champions League highlights rather than the full games, catching glimpses of Zizou at his scintillating best. The full matches they did watch would be games like the 1998 World Cup Final or the 2002 Champions League Final, in which Zidane had iconic moments, and everyone hailed him as being some kind of mythical figure of legend. As is so often the case, perception matters far more than reality. Someone like Kevin De Bruyne, for example, has been more consistently brilliant than Zizou was, but has almost none of the mysticism. How the two are remembered, and their respective legacies within the game, are likely to be quite instructive. I can still vividly remember getting home from school on a Tuesday or Wednesday afternoon, eating my tea, discarding my homework, because I was a bad lad, don't be like me kids, going up to my bedroom and putting the Champions League on ITV. That excitement to see the best players in the biggest competition in the infancy of social media, when football seemed to exist in more isolation, and you could watch it for football's sake and just enjoy it, either entirely unaware or just unmoved by the discourse which surrounded it, which is matched by my excitement levels for very few games now, if any, that is partly nostalgia. In fact, it is very nostalgic. But it's not just that. For whoso hath too much of any good, of that same good he shall be soon bereft, wrote John Lydgate in his poem The Fall of Princes in 1430. Perhaps, when it comes to football on television, we have had too much of a good thing, creating a sense of saturation and disillusionment. Of course, we still watch it though, and the financial incentives ensure that there will only ever be more football, as competitions everywhere continue to expand, and the football calendar further bursts at the seams, with zero consideration for the knock-on effects in terms of player welfare or entertainment, and by extension, more football on television. 
What's more, it's not just that systems have changed in football, they've also become much more universal. I'd pose this as a question, rather than as a statement of fact, but any of you who are my age or above, does it not feel, at least, as though teams used to have more distinct and unique identities? I am thinking of Bolton Wanderers under Sam Allardyce, with even Campo, JJ Kocha, Yuri Jekiev and Kevin Davies among others, Roy Hodgson's Fulham, featuring Mark Schwarzer, Breda Hangerland, Zoltan Gera, Bobby Zamora and Clint Dempsey, Pulis Ball at Stoke, perhaps most obviously, typified by the likes of Ryan Shawcross, Robert Huth, Rory Delap, Abdullai Faye and Ricardo Fuller, Moises Everton, O'Neill's Villa, and before that, Keegan's Entertainers at Newcastle, Wimbledon's so-called Crazy Gang, and the early Wenger era at Arsenal. The list goes on and on. It felt as though so many games were a clash, not just of two football teams, but of two fundamentally different styles, ways of playing the game and profiles of player, presenting unique and intriguing battles. Even as I am speaking though, and even though I don't think anything that I've just said is untrue, I can feel the nostalgia seeping out of my pores. The reality is, to a certain extent, every generation has done this. As humans, we tend to look back on our adolescence, youth, and formative years with rose-tinted spectacles. If you go back and watch a lot of the games that I'm talking about, say, Wenger's Arsenal versus Hodgson's Fulham, though there was undoubtedly a huge culture and style clash, some of the football was, well, pretty turgid. Even in a lot of the games between the top teams, if you go back and watch them in full now, again, not just the highlights, there are entire passages of play in which the ball barely touches the ground. We fixate on the Akotchas, Burkamp, Zolas and Cantonars of these eras, for obvious reasons, and tend to forget about the centre-backs who could barely complete a five-yard pass, or the centre-forwards who made a living by elbowing people. It's like when I think about my time at school, 10 years after leaving, I think of spending entire lunch breaks playing football, messing about in lessons, disrupting other people's education, likely to the severe detriment of their grades and future job prospects, sorry about that, and not having a care in the world. All of the bad bits, which was most of it, like sitting in detention, spending five years trying and failing to learn anything about limestone or algebra, or being forced to play rugby, that all fades while the enjoyable bits are magnified. It's a bit of a weird analogy. <laughs> well, Dylan, I suppose it is and it isn't, because in large part, it is the exact same thing. The idea that footballers are worse now, I think is a nonsense. As a collective, Football is a miles better now than ever before. The standards are ridiculous. League 2 and National League players can all trap and pass a ball, which sounds basic, but if you go back and watch League 2 football from the 1990s, you'll know that that hasn't always been the case. The standard throughout the pyramid, and indeed, the talents of those who drop out of the sport entirely having been in academies, is outstanding. And it would be foolish to assume that those at the top aren't also better than ever before, but they're also different, and the sport is different, and it's not just nostalgia, much as we are all guilty of it, to notice that change and to prefer what came before it. That is it for today's video. As ever with video essays on this channel, there is a whole load of stuff that I wanted to but haven't had the chance to talk about, from the rampant elitism and ever more uneven distribution of talent, to the advent of VAR and the impact of social media. But this video is already rather long and Manchester City versus Arsenal is about to start. Yes, football on the television, I am part of the problem. I should add that I have made entire videos about the lack of unpredictability in modern football and the concentration of talent, why there are so few flair players now, my opposition to VAR and the toxic impact of social media on the sport. All of which you are free and even actively encouraged, by me at least, to go and watch after this, which is why they were the topics which received less attention or that I unfortunately had to leave out. Thank you all very much, as ever, for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed today's video or found it remotely interesting. I hope that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And of course, goes without saying, make sure that you are subscribed not just to this channel, HITC7s, and have notifications turned on, but also my second channel, Alfie Potsama, both of which should be about to appear on your screens now. 
You can also find me on Twitter, uh, Instagram, or Threads via the username at HITC7s on all three. And all of those links, plus a whole lot more good stuff, should be down in the video description below. Cheers.